This is an NBC News Now special. The Trump hush money trial verdict. From NBC News headquarters in New York, here's Tom Yamas. Hey, good evening. We are coming to you live tonight at this unprecedented moment in American history. For the first time ever, a former United States president has been convicted of a felony. Former President Donald Trump found guilty on 34 felony counts of falsifying business records to cover up hush money payments made to Stormy Daniels ahead of the 2016 election. The 12 members of a New York jury voting unanimously to convict. It was a stunning moment late today in Lower Manhattan as that verdict was read just after 5 p.m. There are no cameras allowed inside that courtroom, but shortly after the former president emerging, his face stoic, his tone defiant, delivering this message to the reporters gathered in the hallway and to the nation he once served as commander in chief. This was a disgrace. This was a rigged trial by a conflicted judge who was corrupt. It's a rigged trial, a disgrace. They wouldn't give us a venue change. We were at 5% or 6% in this district, in this area. This was a rigged, disgraceful trial. But the real verdict is going to be November 5th by the people. And they know what happened here, and everybody knows what happened here. You have a Soros-backed DA and the whole thing. We didn't do a thing wrong. I'm a very innocent man, and it's okay. I'm fighting for our country. I'm fighting for our Constitution. Our whole country is being rigged right now. This was done by the Biden administration in order to wound or hurt an opponent, a political opponent. And I think it's a, just a disgrace and we'll keep fighting, we'll fight till the end, and we'll win. Because our country's gone to hell. We don't have the same country anymore. We have a divided mess. We're a nation in decline, serious decline. Millions and millions of people pouring into our country right now from prisons and from mental institutions, terrorists, and they're taking over our country. We have a country that's in big trouble. But this was a rigged decision right from day one with a conflicted judge who should have never been allowed to try this case, never. And we will fight for our Constitution. This is long from over. Thank you very much. And a reminder, this case was brought by the Manhattan DA's office, not the Justice Department. Trump's sentencing set for July 11th, where he could face a minimum sentence of probation or up to four years in prison. July 11th, importantly, just four days before the Republican National Convention, where Donald Trump is expected to formally become the Republican nominee for president. Again, this is something we have never before seen in this country. The jury of seven men and five women dismissed following the announcement of the verdict, which they reached after nine and a half hours of deliberation. All eyes then on former President Trump as his motorcade, you see it here, made its way from the courthouse, where he has spent much of the last six weeks, to his home at Trump Tower. And then this, Trump greeted by a small group of cheering supporters there, raising his fist as he acknowledged the crowd before walking into Trump Tower, which is, of course, the same location where prosecutors said Trump had a fateful meeting with his fixer, Michael Cohen, who would become the star witness in this case. Prosecutors say Cohen paid adult film star Stormy Daniels hush money to keep an affair with Trump secret ahead of the 2016 election, then falsified business records to cover up his tracks to influence that election. The jury clearly buying that story. Cohen tonight in a statement writing, today is an important day for accountability and the rule of law. While it has been a difficult journey for me and my family, the truth always matters. And Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, who brought the charges against Trump, acknowledging the gravity of this case shortly after the verdict was reached. While this defendant may be unlike any other in American history, we arrived at this trial and ultimately today at this verdict in the same manner as every other case that comes through the courtroom doors, by following the facts and the law and doing so without fear or favor. And as we've said, Trump not the only first former president to be found guilty of a felony, but also the first major presidential candidate to be convicted of a felony. The big question tonight, how will this conviction play with voters as Trump faces off with President Biden yet again? Could it actually help the former president retake the White House by rallying his base. We'll break down what the polling says a little later. The Biden campaign seizing on the verdict to call voters to action, writing in a statement, 
In New York today, we saw that no one is above the law. Today's verdict does not change the fact that the American people face a simple reality. There is still only one way to keep Donald Trump out of the Oval Office, at the ballot box. Convicted felon or not, Trump will be the Republican nominee for president. This jury may have just re-elected President Trump, but they may have just re-elected President Biden. Or a third reality could be true. It might not matter at all. We've got a full team of reporters, legal experts, and political analysts here to break it all down for you. I want to start first with our NBC News reporters who have been covering this trial from the beginning. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett, senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson, and Tom Winter here to get us started. Laura, for our viewers who might have missed it, I want to go back to that moment when you read the verdict out loud in front of the cameras live on television. Brett, roll that clip. Here we go. Count one, guilty. Count two, guilty. Count three, guilty. Count four, guilty. Count five, guilty. Count six, guilty. Laura, as you're reading that, and, and you know, I felt for you because I know you're, you're thinking in your head, I hope we're right, I hope we're right, I hope we're right, because the entire nation is watching. What were you thinking as you were reading that? I was thinking, I know that we're right, because Tom Winter was the man in the courtroom <laughs> in that seat who I knew was going to get it right and who I trusted. I'm reading this for millions of people, Tom. Please make sure you're in the Google Doc, in the right place. And it was one of those moments where we were sort of tap dancing for a little bit, yeah. knowing that the verdict is coming, but I'm looking Looking at the sheet, trying to make sure we're on top of it, trying to make sure that we're being accurate. And so as soon as I saw that first G, knowing that it was guilty, I had to interrupt to make sure that everyone could understand what was happening, which is sort of a surreal moment because yeah. we've all covered high profile trials yeah. so many times, right? We've, we've done dozens and dozens of these. Nothing is ever like this. And the, the stakes are so high. And we just want to make sure that we're obviously being as accurate and as fair as possible in every case, but particularly given these circumstances. And then is it hitting you that that a former president is being convicted in real time and you're reading this? Uh, yes, although I try not to think about it too hard and get in my head about it and try right. to just re play it as straight as possible. As you could see there, I, there was no color commentary. There was no sort of my interpretation of everything. Yeah. It was just, just straight doing the counts. Yeah. And we did that on purpose so people understand. We yeah. did that intentionally just to be as clear and concise as possible in that moment. So, Tom, you were eyes and ears inside the courtroom because there were right. no cameras. Talk to me and explain to the viewers how, how does that work? Because I know when you guys went in there, you, you weren't sure what was going to happen. You weren't expecting the verdict at first when everyone was being summoned, and then suddenly you're, you're typing away and it's going right over to Laura. Well, we were initially told that the jurors were going to go home for the day, and the former president and the presumptive Republican nominee is sitting there with his attorneys, and they're laughing and they're talking because it's just going to be another day, and we're going to move on till tomorrow, and all of a sudden the judge come back, comes back, very different demeanor, and says, I have to tell you, we got a note at 420, and the jurors have told us there's a verdict, they need a little more time to fill out those forms. <clears throat> But we're coming back. And that was just an, uh, an immediate 180 in the courtroom. It was quiet. We have to respect the process. We're there purely as observers. But all of a sudden, you can hear the air conditioning. Mm. You could hear just a few little clacks of the keyboard. You have your laptop, your phone. How are, you, how are you communicating? So I bet you don't know where you were on March 20th, 2004. For anybody on this panel, but I remember because yeah. that was the verdict for the United States versus Martha Stewart. That's the first case that I covered for this company and in this business. And back then, we had to hold up placards through a window, through an internal courtyard of federal court, to somebody who had been on a payphone since 7 in the morning. And this was after lunch holding a payphone, holding the line on our 1-800 number here at NBC <laughs> to tell the control room what was going on. And, and then the rest of us had to walk out with the same placard yeah. to make sure everybody knew what the verdict was. Much more modern today. Microsoft Surface, Google Doc, and basically just typing in one of three letters. That's what it was. And then from there, we have the ability to mirror that across all of our control rooms most importantly to the person reading it on the air. When it was guilty, 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 mm -hmm. people stunned, quiet. What was the reaction in the courtroom? It was absolutely quiet. You know, you, you never know. Laura and I were talking about it earlier this evening. You, you cover these cases, you get into it, you start reading the juror instructions, you think of all the permutations that could happen, and you start to wonder, will it be a guilty verdict? Will there be a not guilty verdict? How is this all going to go? And then it comes out, and it's just kind of what you might have thought it was going to be going into it, given the, the composition of the jury, the yeah. type of case it was, what was coming forward. And the fact, it, it, this always throws everybody off, the reading of a verdict is always very fast. Yeah. Mm. There's a lot of tension in the courtroom. There's a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. And so 
one of the courtroom staffers says count two, guilty immediately by the by the uh, jury four person, and then they just go from there. They're just mm -hmm. ticking right on down the tracks. Hallie, as we're looking at the video and I'm watching the, the yeah. stills that were coming out of court afterwards, and President Trump, former President Trump, defiant with his fist up. We're looking at a man that was on trial. We're also looking at a man that is running for president. Let's talk about the politics of this, and sure. we're going to go back to the case as well, because the big question is this. I I'm listening to Tom. I'm listening to Laura. It it it's also dramatic. We've been following it as journalists for the last six weeks. But the only question tonight is, does it move the needle? Yeah, and we don't have an answer for that yet. I mean, just to be totally candid, here's what we do know. We're paying a lot of attention to it. About a third of Americans, based on polling, say they really aren't paying much attention to it. They are tonight, I'm willing to bet, because this is news mm -hmm. that would, of course, break through, I think. Um, but about two-thirds to three-quarters of voters say that this previously had said a conviction wouldn't change their minds, that it wouldn't change their vote one way or the other, right? The question is going to be what happens with some of these voters, especially, and we're looking at independents because they're going to be critical here, especially the slice of independents, anywhere from maybe 10 to 20 plus percent, who say that they might be less likely to vote for the former president if he were to be convicted. Hypotheticals are different than reality. We now have reality. Donald Trump has been convicted on these 34 felony counts. You're seeing some of the numbers here. It's interesting in this most recent poll, I think this is the NPR Marist poll. It is, yeah. It is. 15% upper left, upper right-hand corner of independents say they're more likely to vote for Trump if he were convicted. Uh, this is obviously a, a good poll. The numbers are good. We've seen a, a little bit of that. I think the more important number might be the, the others on the bottom of the screen there. It makes no difference for 65% of Democrats, Republicans, and about 75% of independents. All of this said, a lot is going to depend on how these candidates handle this moving forward, both of these candidates specifically. Um, and I think it's worth noting how you've seen the Republican Party really fall in line, even tonight, behind mm -hmm. former President Trump. Mm -hmm coming out on the cable networks, sort of these, these people who are on the short list for running mate, speaking out now on his behalf, lining up behind it, even Senator Mitch McConnell, who is no fan of Donald Trump these right. days, suggesting that he believes, just in the last few minutes, that this is going to be, in his view, overturned on appeal. I'll leave it to the legal experts to assess that, but the fact that he is even weighing in, albeit hours later, right. I think is notable here. L Laura, the, the jury instructions were a little complicated. Understanding yeah. what was happening, what the crime was, was yeah. a little complicated. Talk to me about the three moments for our viewers. What were the three moments that made this case? Uh, the three moments uh, that made this case, I think, were one of the first moments which was David Pecker. Mm. Remember, he is the tabloid boss, the yeah. head of the National Enquirer. He is the one who puts the former president in the room where it happens, where prosecutors had said this conspiracy to suppress when bad the plot stories. Was hatched. Yep. Exactly. And so because he puts Trump in the room, Michael, K Michael Cohen, the former fixer, then carries it to the Oval. And so those were sort of the two signposts. And it was interesting that the jury asked for readbacks of <laughs> those two men. That was the testimony. When I heard that they wanted readbacks, of those testimony that told me they moved past the falsification of business records, right? That was the core charge, is that he doctored his business yeah. records to cover up the conspiracy. But if, if they want to hear from Pecker, that means they want to hear about the conspiracy. They've already decided something on the falsification. Mm -hmm. We didn't know yet that they had found he had committed the falsification of business records. But I do think that was one of the key moments. Obviously, Michael Cohen was a huge moment. Stormy Daniels was a huge moment. And those were the three big witnesses. There was obviously Hope Hicks. It was sort of a round robin of different people people in Trump's orbit, but I do think at the end of the day, everyone thought of Cohen as the star witness. I think it was Pecker the whole time. And was there one big mistake? Was there one big mistake that, that stands out to you? Was it was it the last witness? Was it the defense sort of playing to the jury, but playing to Trump? I think it was Cohen. I think yeah. they put all their eggs in the Cohen basket, and they were so just hungry to damage him and to beat him up and to call him a, the MVP of liars, to call yeah. him the gloat, the greatest liar of all time. They put so much emphasis into that that if the jury thought, you know what, I understand why he's angry. Trump dropped him like a hot potato when the feds came calling. That's and it what, didn't pay that, him, right? It didn't, yeah, it didn't right, pay first, him, right? And so if, if they put all their eggs in the Cohen basket, then if, if the jurors thought, like, no, I can get it, I, I can get on board with Cohen, then what case do they I don't have? believe him all the time, but I believe him this time. Yeah. Tom, what do you want to say? Well, I was going to say, you know, what's interesting about this case is the FBI first opened their investigation into these payments in the middle of 2007. So the fact that Stormy Daniels received a payment, this 
this Michael Cohen character, this Michael Pecker character, what was the National Enquirer doing? We've heard about this for a long time. What will be interesting to me to merge a little bit of the political and the legal worlds here, if we ever do get to the other two federal criminal trials that are pending for the former president, likelihood probably not very high, but when the public starts to hear and viewers start to hear about the details in those cases, will those make an impact mm -hmm. versus this case where I think some of the facts, even though some of the testimony, Laura, was certainly interesting and some of it was new, I think the general fact pattern here was kind of well known. Hallie, I'm going to ask you a question. You may not have the answer, but oh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at your, your crystal ball. You know, we've had E. Jean Carroll. We, we've had this, right. this civil Someone case. We, we've, had, we've had so many cases sure. and things that have happened to former President Trump. Will we be talking about this in October? Well, based on where the numbers are right now, the things that voters want to talk about are the economy and immigration. They want to talk about inflation and they want to talk about the border. They've been very consistent about that, that those are the issues motivating them to the ballot box. It's been interesting. We have this amazing team of embeds, yeah. right? These these campaign reporters that are out in the field and all night they've been gathering interviews mm -hmm. with people yeah. in these key swing states in Arizona and in Pennsylvania and it is fascinating to look at because what you're seeing is so much of the reaction tonight falling along party lines, frankly, from people, Trump supporters who say this doesn't change my opinion, Biden supporters who say I'm glad justice is done, right? And, and there's yeah. obviously nuance in that as well, but I do think that that's been a super interesting piece of this here. I also think, listen, to Tom's point here, there are other cases, other legal issues that the former president faces that legal experts think are, are more serious, that could yeah. be potentially more damaging to him, it is unlikely that those come to bear before the election. We're waiting, you know this well, our justice correspondent, for the Supreme Court mm -hmm. to, to make a, a case, a ruling yeah. on the immunity claim that he's made in his federal election interference case. TBD, probably before the end of June or early July. Uh, the, the Florida classified documents case is wrapped up in these procedural motions, et cetera. The next hearing on that isn't for a couple months. Same thing for Georgia, where they're set to hear in August, the former president president's claim that the prosecutor, appealing a claim that the prosecutor shouldn't be bringing the case against him. All of which is to say, we are months away from those other yeah. cases. So, you know, do, does this have legs? I am pretty sure that the Biden campaign is going to use this, not to point to the legal issues, but to say this is the character of the person yeah. you're electing, because they have tried to press the character case against Donald Trump, the drama case, the, do you really want this guy back in office for four more years? Remember what this is like right. as part of a broader uh, messaging campaign. And we're going to be discussing all of that throughout this broadcast. Hallie, Tom, Laura, great job. I know some of you guys are sticking around. We'll talk to you guys more in just a moment, but because we want to go now to Trump Tower live. Vaughn Hilliard is down there. Vaughn, I know you've made your way from the courthouse to Trump Tower. Talk to me about the scene tonight. I was hearing mixed reports. There's supporters, there's protesters. What exactly is happening? And then the president, the former president apparently had dinner plans tonight. Right. We're at, uh, just to give folks an idea of where Trump Tower is at, it's Fifth Avenue and 56th Street here in Midtown Manhattan. We're about four blocks from Central Park. This is a very highly trafficked area on most nights. We've got about a dozen of his supporters that are out here, a lot of other bypassers that are coming around here. For Donald Trump, he is currently on the Upper East Side of New York at a dinner fundraiser. He'll be returning to Trump Tower tonight for the night before tomorrow, having a press conference at 11 a.m. Eastern Time here from Trump Tower. You saw that he delivered those short remarks upon leaving the courthouse following his conviction there. But for Donald Trump, this is just beginning. He's got five months until the general election, Tom. Um, do, we, do we also know that the, the former president is going to have a press conference tomorrow discussing some of the trial? Do we know anything more about that? We don't have specifics on what his intention is, but for anybody that follows his social media post over the last two hours, he has given a pretty good of indication of where this is going to go. Not only saying that he will be appealing the decision from Lower Manhattan today, but also that November 5th is going to be the real verdict day. November 5th, of course, is 159 days away, and that is the general election. For Donald Trump, his fate today was determined on these 34 felony counts by 12 New York jurors. But for Donald Trump, he he has every contention of making this uh, 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 ultimately a decision that comes down to the public court of opinion. And so for him, that means going on the campaign trail, hitting the TV airwaves and going making his own case, because the reality is, is that the justice system played out how it did here this evening. But he's got an election on his hands. We should note, though, Tom, that his sentencing is slated to take place on July 11th, four days before the beginning of the Republican National Convention, when he is slated to be formally nom nominated as 
is the Republican nominee. And so that will be a very decisive time. And there could very well be jail time as part of that punishment. Of course, if he was elected, we would expect that the prison time to be suspended until after he were to serve. But it only raises the stakes, this conviction does, of what is going to be coming on November 5th, again, 159 days from now in the general election, Tom. Vaughn Hilliard for us. Vaughn, we appreciate all your reporting. For more on this verdict and to dig a little bit more into the legalities of everything, I want to bring in Adam Kaufman. He's a former assistant district attorney with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Michael Vanderveen, a former Trump lawyer and criminal defense attorney. And Lanny Davis, Michael Cohen's former lawyer and legal advisor. Lanny, I'm going to start with you. Have you had a chance to speak with Michael Cohen tonight? And even if you haven't, Talk to us about his headspace. He was called the greatest liar of all time. He was trashed by the Trump defense team. Um, and he stood there for, for hours testifying. What does today mean for him? So first of all, I haven't talked to him. I'm no longer his lawyer. And I, I want to focus on the evidence. But I have said many, many times, Michael Cohen was found to be truthful under tough cross-examination in front of New York Supreme Court judge anger on in the financial fraud case. And the judge wrote that he was credible and truthful. And the tactic of using the entire defense to shout names in a courtroom when they're not evidence and not provide any counter to documents that do not lie means that this verdict was a verdict based on the facts and the documents. Michael, you represented uh, former President Trump. You worked with him. How hard is it to work with him? Because some people have said that Todd Blanche, you know, he had a case to present to the jury, but he also had a case to present to his client, former President Trump, and that can be difficult. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure how much I really make of that. My experience was that he was uh, a, a very good client. He was easy to work with. I found him, first of all, to be a pretty uh, humorous guy. Uh, he seemed... Uh, intent on giving you what he thought were the important points that he wanted to make. But he gave us a free hand, both in the impeachment trial and then in the Manhattan trial. Well, I ask you about that because some people said that maybe Blanche had some missteps in, in the closing arguments and bringing up people like Bob Costello in trying to relitigate Stormy Daniels. Th those were missed opportunities. You know, I, I don't know. I, I, I thought Blanche did a good job. I thought, you know, he, he, I thought he's a very good lawyer. I think he did a good job. And frankly, this is a historic trial. Uh, the, the, what he was able to accomplish in this trial was much more important to him than am I going to get another case from Donald Trump? I mean, he, 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 he's in the history books. But he lost the case. He did lose the case. But, I, uh, but he defended the case in a way that I think was probably much more motivated by what's the best defense that I can put on rather than, hey, I'm going to please my client. You know, we all uh, usually have con conflicts with our clients, and, you know, and, and there are a lot of disagreements. Um, but there are only two decisions in this case that were Donald Trump's and Donald Trump's alone. And that was to plead not guilty, and that was to testify or not. Uh, and uh, otherwise, you know, he, he has input into the case and the lawyer has input in the case. Those are his decisions. And, you know, the, 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 both of the, 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 that second decision probably had an effect on this trial. Adam, was this case winnable for the defense? It's really a hard case to win. I mean, I... But it's untested legal theory. Well, but that's a different issue, right? Yeah. There's the issue of it's an untested legal theory. The jury doesn't know and doesn't care that it's an untested legal theory. They don't know that. What they hear is the evidence in the courtroom. Right. Right? And and you look at the documents and, and you know, and I agree, Cohen... Uh, was well corroborated, and that's so important in a case like this. But so the legal theory, the untested nature of it, that's going to be an issue that might be hashed out on appeal, but not in the courtroom. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to understand because, you know, in looking at this case, there were key witnesses that never showed up to trial, that were never called by either side, including Alan Weisselberg, the man. The, go ahead, we'll go, go. Yeah, well, <laughs> Weisselberg tested in our trial. Weisselberg didn't testify because Weisselberg has showed 100% support and loyalty to the, the president. So he wasn't going to take the stand and say anything that the prosecutors wanted the jury to hear. Weisselberg was going to jail twice for, for, for his loyalty and would have been willing to go a third time if somebody thought again, oh, he perjured himself and we're going to charge him again. Laney, you, you worked with Michael Cohen. You, you were his lawyer. Um, Michael Cohen obviously has um, yeah, a reputation that, that is, can be debated by both sides. Um, 
Do you think that Michael Cohen has finally sort of um, received justice? I mean, he did hard time. He defended Donald Trump till the end until he didn't. His family was put through so much. And, and now Donald Trump is a convicted felon. Look, uh, I'm a former lawyer for Michael, so I just have to follow certain rules and not comment about Michael. But I can say what I have previously said. Every word that he testified to was backed up by documents, including Mr. Weisselberg, who wrote down $130,000, multiplied it by two, to take care of income taxes. And yet Donald Trump's defense was that number was legal fees. If you lie about that number being about legal fees, when everybody, certainly the jury and everybody knew that number was about Stormy Daniels, that's the end of the defense. You lie about legal fees, then the conspiracy can be believed by the jury that he knew he wasn't paying legal fees to Stormy Daniels. He lied and recorded them as legal fees. That, to me, is the logic of the jury looking at that document, and that document speaks for itself. And Weisselberg was the most important witness against Mr. Trump because of his own handwriting and what I just said. Reasonable doubt. They needed one juror. They, they couldn't get there. I, I don't know if you can describe the jurors getting to this verdict in, 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 a, in a fast manner. It seemed fast to me. I didn't go to law school. Um, and, I, and I bring all this up because it, it sounds like the, the prosecutors convince the jury easily. I mean, because they, they, they got back, they wanted to hear the instructions once again, and it was unanimous on all, on all the counts. And so my question to you, Adam, I mean, like, did, did the because you guys were talking about the defense, I mean, was the case winnable, or, or, or was, it, was it over from the get-go? It, it's, look, any time a criminal case goes to trial, as defense attorneys, we know it, 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 it's, it's difficult for the defense. Um, the prosecution gets up there, they put on their case, and most criminal cases that go to trial end up as convictions. The prosecution did a great job. Um, I think that there, I, I think there were some mistakes missteps by the defense. I think that I, I would have talked more about the fact that Weisselberg wasn't called. Why wasn't he called? He's yeah. the one, right? Um, I think that putting on, you know, one thing to think about is the defense doesn't have any burden. And so they can sit back and do nothing and just poke holes at the people's, the prosecution's yeah. case. When they put on a witness, now it gives the jury something to balance, something to weigh. And so if you're going to put on a case, it's got to be more than Costello. Right. Because now you're putting, you go from having nothing and the jury just has to focus on the prosecution case, and then you put something up there, it's so feather light that now the jury is weighing the two sides. Michael, would you put up more of a defense? Uh, Witness-wise, you mean? Witness-wise, case-wise, I mean? You know, probably not. Generally, in a criminal defense case, it's the government's burden, and you don't put on too many uh, d d defendant, uh, defense witnesses. It's cross-examination. We make our living on cross and closing. Uh, we, we don't do a lot of direct examinations. But I want to tell you, a year ago, we did a mock jury trial on, on our trial, and we uh, did deep-dive jury questionnaires and evaluation of the Manhattan jury pool. Eight and a half out of ten people had very strong feelings against the president. The other one and a half just didn't like him. So <laughs> It was know, hard to, to win a case in Manhattan, is what you're saying? Yeah, it was hard to win a case in Manhattan, but I, I have such faith in the jury system. I mean, it really is the best system that we have. And, and, and I'm a little disheartened because the presumption of innocence and, and, and that guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, from when it was first written to where it is now is really a Does he have, we only have 30 seconds, does he have a chance for an appeal? Oh, I think he's got a couple issues on appeal, absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. In the jury instructions, probably there's some issues on appeal, some of the trial evidence that came in. There's a couple of issues there that, that will be interesting. Okay, guys, we thank you so much for being here. Our coverage of this historic verdict is just getting started. When we come back, the political fallout of Trump's guilty conviction, will it hurt or help his reelection bid? And what does it mean for the Biden campaign? Will they change course? Stay with us. I'm disappointed that it's come down to a court in New York uh, to paint it exactly how the Democrats would like it. Um, but I think a lot of people are smart enough to see through some of this. I was just very excited to see that people are still willing to, you know, vote for democracy and be willing to 
confront somebody so large and in charge? In the long run, it might hurt them. Judging by everything, it's... A lot of people say your past doesn't matter, but in certain situations, yeah, your past kind of does matter. That's your resume for you. Yeah, ethically, I, th I would want to vote for a president that is ethically upright, and I don't... I can't say the same for either president right now, which makes me incredibly uncomfortable. And um, yeah, I, I'm really not sure what to do at this point, uh, at this moment. And, and uh, yeah, I'm not looking forward to the elections. And that was a reaction from voters across the country speaking to our reporters after former President Trump was found guilty by a New York jury of 34 counts of falsifying business records. This verdict coming against the backdrop of the 2024 election, which rests right now on a razor's edge. For more on the political fallout from former President Trump's conviction, I want to bring in our political pros tonight. Jen Psaki, former Biden White House press secretary and an MSNBC anchor, and Hogan Gidley, former White House principal deputy press secretary during the Trump administration. Thank you both for being here. Jen, I want to start with you. Um, if you had the president's here tonight and, and you're talking about the campaign, what advice do you give him about this conviction? How, how can they use this to their advantage or, or they can't? I actually think the statement they gave was exactly the right tone. It was this short. We respect the rule of law and have no additional comment. Now, they left it to the campaign. The campaign put out a much longer statement. The key line in this is there is still only one way to keep Donald Trump out of the Oval Office at the ballot box. And I think what's important about their strategy at this point, if you're in the White House or you're on the campaign, what you're trying to manage is this is not a moment for cheering. This is not a moment for celebrating campaign staff, White House staff, others, even people who strongly dislike President Trump. This is a serious moment where the former president of the United States was convicted on 34 counts. Um, and what they, I think, what I would advise him to do is to keep focused on the range of issues that the American public is focused on. You have a debate coming up. There are lots of issues to debate out there. Abortion rights, the economy, climate, etc. Does that speak to the, the, the post-Trump presidency era we live in? Or do you think that's just the nature of this campaign? Because we just had this historical moment. A former president was convicted of a crime. And you're essentially saying... That, that, that happened, but we got to focus on everything else. I think voters are going to make a choice. And you heard there was a smattering yeah. of views from the voters that your reporters and our reporters talked to, which tells you a lot, right? People don't know how to digest this. They don't right. know what to make of it yet. The politics of it, I think, are quite unpredictable at this moment. There's a range of polls that have been out there, yeah. which shows that a very small percentage of people um, who were asked who are Trump supporters would consider changing their mind. Now, that yeah. consider... And some independents, that would actually, it helps Trump. It, it, yeah. So it, it's a range. Now, it, the election is going to be decided in about seven states by a small number of voters. So if some people do, that will make a difference. But I think if you're the Biden team, it's about not dancing on this. Yeah. This is going to happen on its own. And you have to go back to taking, seizing the moment and talking about the issues that a lot of people care Deeply about. Hogan, you told me yesterday an acquittal would be the best case scenario. This is the exact yep. opposite of this. This is, I think, a, a B plus, bad It'd be plus. The worst case scenario. B, B plus, bad plus, terrible, yeah. uh, to quote succession. Uh, is this a bad day for the campaign, or is this in some weird way a good day for the campaign? Well, look, it's a long time between now and November. Obviously, a lot of things are going to happen, and Jen's absolutely right. The Biden folks need to be worried about the issues at hand here because Donald Trump, while this will be a bump in the road, no doubt, they're going to have their day tomorrow when Trump comes out and addresses the American people. He will. Uh, but if he continues to make this about those issues, that's what the campaign's going to be about, okay? You touched on something, Jen, you're right. A sliver of votes here. We're talking about the last election being decided by three states, 42,000 votes. That's it. And so the margins here are going to matter. What happened today is big. It is historic. But how that shakes out between now and November, time will tell. But I still think it comes down to the issues that everyone cares about. You played some clips from people out there with different opinions about this. But it comes down to, can I pay for my car? Can I pay for my rent? Can I pay for my mortgage? Can I buy gas? Can I buy groceries? Those are the things that people are going to care about and vote on in November. Jen, is there a danger here, if you go back to 2016, mm -hmm. where... It was Trump coverage all the time, and Hillary Clinton could not get a word in yes. edgewise. And, and look, there, I'm not saying that's the reason why she lost the election, but that did happen. That was reality. It's happening right now. You, you, President Biden, he was just working, trying to get the black vote yesterday with Vice President Harris. That got minimal attention yeah. because this, this sucked up all the oxygen. Is there also a danger in this? 
It's a huge challenge for them. I mean, I, I think that's why they did the sort of stunt with Robert De Niro the other day, uh, was to try to inject themselves into the coverage. They did that. They have a couple of audiences here. One of them is the base of the Democratic Party. That's one of the biggest challenges the Biden campaign has right now, it's, and opportunities too, is bringing those voters home. And voters need to know that there's life in the campaign. That's why they did that, I think. They to want to show themselves. some teeth, essentially. They want to show some teeth and some kind of passion. I will just say, though, I think one of the things you said, it, you know, Trump has not shown, at least from what I've watched, and you can disagree with me, that's fine, any desire to talk about issues other than this trial, right? I mean, he's dove into this trial. They, they're fundraising He'll, he'll inject the border. He'll inject wars like, in his comments. And we'll yeah. see what happens in the next couple of weeks. We, we'll have to watch that. But, but he has been running on the trial and as being the victim. And so I think a question to me is, does he break out of that and start to talk about other issues or not? He hasn't too much to date. Yeah, but, but yes, he does. And yes, he will. But he's not the only victim here. He would argue the American people are the victim because of the policies that they've been kicked victim. in the teeth. I mean, I think the legal system worked its way through. I, 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 I think he's I'm campaigning saying he's as going that. to campaign as that, and he's also going to say the American people are also victims because you're seeing drugs pouring in our, into our communities, a wide open southern border, crime, uh, obviously the economy's in shambles. That's what the campaign will be about, and that's the debate. And so, starting from this moment moving forward, what Donald Trump focuses on will absolutely have to do with some weaponization pieces of the federal government and through letter agencies because he feels as though he's a victim of that. But a lot of people in this country feel they're victims of the same thing in various forms and fashions. So that's going to be part of it. But Joe Biden, while he does want to talk about issues, he rarely himself talks about issues that poll in the top three. He doesn't talk about immigration. He doesn't talk about the economy much. He's out there trying to court black voters. It's almost June. You're trying to get your base and solidify your base. And Jen rightly pointed out he has a real problem with that at this point. Trump has the base and has had it for the whole year. So it's tough for Biden to have to spend time, effort, money doing that at this point. Jen, does the Biden-Harris reelect team, do they have to explain to voters that this wasn't our case, okay? This was the Manhattan DA, this was not politics, or that's just... That, that's, that's just a waste of time. I think they do that in part by how they handle it, right? You yeah. know, I, there were some reports that are wrong that Biden was, President Biden was going to give a speech or something. That sort. was out there from the White House, right? There right? was yeah. something. It sounded like a strange that move. That doesn't right. seem to be. That doesn't seem to be what their plan was. Yeah. They recognized from talking to them that they're going to. He's going to have to respond to this at some point in time. The reporter will yell a question yep. at him, something along those lines. And I think the statement today from them, which was so limited, it was about the rule of law and respect of the rule mm -hmm. of law, is kind of saying the message of the seriousness of this moment. This is a this is a jury of 12 peers. This is how our legal system works, our justice system works. And I think that will be continue to be their emphasis from does, the White House. Does this become part of the debate? I mean, does he use this as a strategy to get under Trump's skin in the debate and call him a felon, say he was convicted, saying he was the first president to, to go down? You know, I, I, I think that, that that's part of what they're going to discuss over the coming weeks. I would be very surprised if Joe Biden calls Donald Trump a convicted felon on the debate stage just as it's not his style, right? I think what he would go to is kind of values and rule of law, and I'm a candidate who respects the rule of law. But I also think what they're going to want to talk about on the debate stage is more issues like abortion rights and abortion access. And some of the issues, to your point, Tom, that haven't broken through, right? That if you look at the polling, 20 percent of the public in the recent New York Times poll blamed Joe Biden for the overturning yeah. of Dobbs, right? They have other areas and other business they need to do in that debate. I don't think he calls him a convicted felon. I think he finds finds a way to wink at um, his legal challenges and his disrespect for the rule of law. Chen Saki, Hogan Gidley, always love talking with you guys. And I always love when you guys are civil. This is always great. This yes, is sir. great. You guys are always friendly. Uh, boxing gloves are out there. OK, uh, we're going to keep it going here. Uh, there are still several criminal cases against the former president hanging the balance. Where do those cases stand? Much more of our NBC News special when we come right back. All right, we're back now with an NBC News Now special history made inside a New York courtroom. A jury finding former President Trump guilty of falsifying business records in connection to hush money payments. The verdict making Trump the first former president to ever be convicted of felony crimes. The jury handing down that stunning conviction guilty on all 34 counts after just nine and a half hours of deliberations. Seven men, five women siding with the prosecution, affirming Trump played a role in a cover-up to corrupt the 2016 presidential election. After the verdict, Trump greeting a massive crowd, you see him here outside Trump Tower, raising his hand and announcing he will hold the news conference at 11 a.m. Eastern tomorrow morning. Judge Marchand setting a July 11th sentencing date, just four days ahead 
of the Republican National Convention, where the GOP is set to select him as their nominee for president. But the president still has other legal issues that are being worked out. We're going to break it all down. And remember, this trial is out of New York, and it's not the only criminal case the former president faces. He may face as many as three more, with one in Georgia and two at the federal level up in the air right now. Most legal experts say those cases are far from serious for Mr. Trump. The thing is, those three are delayed big time right now to the point that they may not even start until after the election. We're going to have to wait and see. For more on these cases and what happens next, I want to bring in our good friends again, NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett and NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Laura, I'm going to start with you because I want to make sure our viewers understand yes. what's next in this case. and. Could Trump possibly be behind bars? Next, in this case, we're going to go to sentencing. As you laid out, on July 11th, Judge Mershon's going to bring everybody in, and he is in the driver's seat there. He made very clear to this jury, don't think about a prison sentence. I don't have to even prescribe a prison sentence. I'm going to do this. It's totally within my discretion to do anything from po mm -hmm. probation to four years in prison. And we should make clear, because it's a low-level felony, four years is the max. That's as high as it's going to go, and he doesn't stack it, even though it was 34 counts, it's just four years, period. But there's no guarantee he's going to get those four years, right? He doesn't have any criminal history. Right. He's approaching 80 years old. I think the judge might be inclined to give him something more on the lower end. But I also recognize that you and I have talked about this is a person who the judge thinks, these are not my words, the judge thinks flouted the law. He thinks yeah. he's had multiple violations of this gag order. He threatened to throw him behind bars before, and he didn't do it. He said, please don't make me do it. I recognize that you're the former president and current front runner. Please don't make me do this. And so I think that moment on July 11th is just going to be another one for the history books. Danny, we've covered a lot uh, on this network the crimes committed in the city of New York where people don't go to jail at all. They, they bail out. Uh, undocumented immigrants have assaulted police officers and then bailed out right away. There's a problem with people going to prison in New York right now. Do you think the president gets prison time? I do not. I think the odds are that he does not. Still, there is a chance. It's a Class E felony, the lowest level felony, as Laura just explained. They're not going to run him consecutively. They will run concurrently. He's over 70 years old, nonviolent crime, no criminal history, no guns, no drugs. Uh, all of the factors point toward a strong case for a probation-only sentence. And I would add, and this would be the defense argument in me, mm -hmm. I would argue that this is a case where the loss is zero. There's no loss. There's no identifiable victims. Now, mm -hmm. reasonable minds can disagree. There, there's an argument to be made that, look, there were people who were defrauded. After all, that's one of the definitions of the crime, and it was the people of the state of New York, for example example. But when you look at traditional fraud cases, you don't have traditional victims, as you often do in these prosecutions where someone's defrauded out of money, they turn money over, or someone defrauds the government out of money, like welfare benefits or something like that. So as a defense attorney, that would be the argument I would make, that the loss amount, which is yeah. the main driver in fraud cases, the loss amount here would be zero. But again, I do expect the prosecution is going to ask for incarceration. It's a great point. I want to combine your amazing legal minds right now, kind of like a Boltron lawyer. Um, first, explain to our viewers that this was untested legal theory. Yeah. So he, he's been prosecuted on a crime that is... I guess, never been committed or never been tried. And then how does that help him in appeal, Danny? You take that part. But first, explain this part. So the yeah. falsification of business records, which is normally just a misdemeanor, books and records, you hear that a lot. Even the former president calls it the books and records charge. That is not new. That has been charged many, many, many right. times. What is new is that the way that they hooked it, the way that they made it a felony, the way they bumped it up and stepped it up was sort of this choose your own adventure, right? And so they said it was actually a violation of New York state law that prohibits two or more people from conspiring to promote someone's mm -hmm. election through unlawful means. And the right. question for this entire trial was, what was that unlawful means? And the jury on that piece of it didn't have to be unanimous. So we will never know until somebody secures that jury interview what did they think was the unlawful means? The prosecutors offered a variety of different theories, not too much on the proof on any of those. They just sort of floated out what well, could have been the fact that Cohen paid Daniels and it violated the contribution amounts at the right. time. Or maybe it was tax laws. Or maybe it was other books and records. We don't really know what they think the unlawful means is. And we don't have to know because they don't have to be unanimous on that. The hook to the unlawful means using a federal elections charge has never been done before. So when we talk about it being novel, that's why it was novel. Yeah. And that's why this office, as the former president has pointed out, 
thought they might not want to do this. There was dissension in the office. It was known yeah. as the zombie case. Because of that way, it was so novel. Prosecutors were weary about bringing this case for a long time, and the prior district attorney wouldn't do it. So how can that help him on appeal now, Danny? Because exactly as Laura explained, if it is a novel theory, you have a number of different arguments. You might argue it's unconstitutionally vague. You might argue that the... Uh, it was the, out of their jurisdiction. Right? Well, yes, there's that argument, too, that the, the, yeah, I would expect to see an argument that this is this constitutes state enforcement of federal law. I would expect to see that crowbarred in. I would expect to see, let's go back to factually, Stormy Daniels, whether or not her testimony was too prejudicial mm -hmm. or more prejudicial than probative. Uh, you might see some arguments on the jury uh, instructions, but there are a number of avenues for appeal in this case. But lest you think I think that means that it's a strong case, right. nobody on appeal has faces strong odds. Everyone on appeal is living life as a long shot. But it will well, be so, tied up for months. So let me ask you, though, do you think he's got a chance to win this appeal? Uh, he's got, I mean, it, all appeals, like I said, are uh, a hope and a prayer. But uh, on the issues of law, since they are generally reviewed brand new with a fresh set of eyes, uh, he might have a chance, if for no other reason, than this is a novel theory of law. You go back to Mark Pomerantz, and Laura was just talking about the former uh, New York County prosecutor mm -hmm. who joined this team and then left the team, wrote a book about it. According to him, they commissioned up to one or two outside law firms to tell them to figure it out whether what they yeah. theorized was even a crime so if you need an outside law firm to tell an office full of very bright attorneys whether something's a crime yeah. that to me is an indication you might just might have an appealable issue danny c laura jarrett thank you so much i hope that does it for you but probably doesn't you guys <laughs> will probably be working till uh the today show tomorrow we thank you so much all right this verdict marks a number of historic firsts trump is now the first presumptive presidential nominee to be convicted of a felony so how much will this monumental conviction play out when americans head to the polls this november we'll hear from more voters in just a moment All right, welcome back with more of our NBC News Now special as former President Trump is found guilty by a New York jury of 34 counts of falsifying business records. The former president also a candidate, but how is this playing out with Americans, voters across the country? NBC's Shaquille Brewster joins us now from Kenosha, Wisconsin, a battleground state, I should remind you, with some perspective on that topic. Shaq, you talked to voters today after the ver verdict. What did they tell you? Well, Tom, you know, the thing here about Kenosha is that the needle doesn't really need to move that much in order for it to have an impact in this battleground state. Of course, we know how close Wisconsin is every election. This is a county that back in 2016, Donald Trump won by less than a fraction of a percentage point, And it's a county that helped elect the Democratic governor just two years after that. So it's a place where you have those swing voters. And based on the conversations I've been having so far, and it's just a couple of hours after that verdict, after that that conviction, there are some patterns that I've been picking up on. One is that it's still being digested by a lot of people. I've had plenty of conversations where people didn't know the headline or they saw the headline and said, what exactly was he convicted for? But you also hear that for those who do know about it, it's largely reinforcing what they already believed. I want you to listen to some of the exchanges I had with people just in the past couple of hours. Does this impact or alter at all how you view Donald Trump? <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah, why not? Because <laughs> we already didn't work for him. So this just is uh, evidence that he shouldn't be in office. Just because there's a jury doesn't mean anything. There's a lot of people in um, different positions that could be charged for a lot of different things. We're so Pretty far crazy. from what I see. It seems like I try to still vote Trump, but he doesn't seem like as good a candidate. Because of this conviction? Yeah. And that last comment makes you believe that if this continues to be in the headlines, we know there are more court hearings to come. There's that sentencing that we'll have in July that it could shift things around the margins. But the conversations that, have, that I've been having, people have brought up the issues as the things that will help them uh, decide who to support ultimately in this election. They bring up the economy. They bring up health care. They bring up immigration. They say that this is not going to be a determining factor, largely because this doesn't change how they view the former president for the better or for the worst. And how they view their lives and their problems, et cetera, et cetera. Shaq Brewster, thank you so much for that insight. It is so important on a day like today. Trump's New York criminal trial taking up a lot of headlines and hours across the media landscape. Take a look at the upcoming cover of The New Yorker, a cartoonist referencing Trump and a series of handcuffs. 
Time Magazine also referencing the case on their June cover of this picture with the gavel and Trump's face right there. Stephen Hayes is editor and CEO of The Dispatch and a friend of this broadcast, an NBC News political analyst. Washington Post media critic Eric Wemple is joining us as well. And Yahoo Finance senior reporter Alexandra Canal. Eric, I want to start with you because I've read you over the years. You don't pull any punches. I want you to pull out your report card. And I would love if you could be specific. How did the media do this time around on this trial? Um, I think that by and large, <laughs> if you like live updates, well, there are a lot of live updates uh, from all these news outlets. And I found them pretty helpful for the most part. I think that, you know, uh, places like my own employer, Washington Post, New York Times, all the big newspapers covered it well. I watched a lot of MSNBC, found it enlightening. CNN, I found strong too. I thought Fox was shoveling the same crap into the public square that they've been shoveling for the past nearly three decades. Um, and, and, I thought it was a pretty straightforward thing to cover because there's the proceedings all day. There's there's stuff that the judge uh, was saying. There's stuff that the, the defense counsel and the prosecutor was saying. It was I thought a pretty uh, a steady and heavy diet of news, and I think that that was I think that was justified because this was, after all, the criminal prosecution of uh, a former president. So I thought that the over coverage, such as it was, was 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 well placed. Well, Stephen, that, that leads to my next question to you, right? A former president is on trial. It's a historic moment for the country. Um, but was this case overcovered? I mean, there's still two wars happening overseas. There are issues here at home with immigration. President Biden was out there trying to rally black voters. That, that didn't get a whole lot of coverage. Uh, or was it covered, you think, the right amount? No, I mean, I agree for the reasons that Eric suggests, that it wasn't overcovered. I mean, this is the president of the United States. He's in, he's in trial. There's a lot to cover. There's 80 hours of, of testimony, 80 hours in the courtroom. I think it required the kind of coverage that we saw. The one thing I think it was missing from a lot of the coverage, not from all of it, but from a lot of the coverage, was more context about exactly the, the theory of the case and what Alvin Bragg was doing. Uh, I'm no fan of Donald Trump, but I think there are legitimate complaints that Republicans have been making about the way that this case was brought about, about the sort of triple bank shot elements of, of this case um, that, that made it, I think, very unique and uh, a legal stretch. And that was true. I think you had legal experts, legal analysts on the left saying that when they unveiled the, the indictment itself and the statement of facts, people thought, boy, there seemed to be some holes in there. And that context, I think, would have been helpful for people to understand, in part, the reaction that we're seeing right now. Alexandra, were Americans watching? I mean, were ratings up? I know on cable news networks like our own MSNBC, CNN, they went gavel to gavel on a mm -hmm. trial where the cameras weren't allowed in court. Yeah, so the trial took place over about a month and a half. So the May numbers are the ones to really focus on. And in terms of those primetime viewership numbers for the month of May, we saw upticks across the board for all of the major cable networks. But one stood out, and that is Fox News. No surprise there, it's a conservative-leaning news network. It really caters to Trump's base. But year over year, viewership was up about 41% to hit 2 million. MSNBC was about flat. CNN saw an uptick of about 5%. And then those younger demographics, around 24 to 55, that actually saw some downward trends for MSNBC and CNN. But again, Fox up nearly 50%. So those are just the primetime figures. And then when you think about the daytime broadcasts, especially yeah. during the testimonies of uh, Stormy Daniels, that was just a win across the board. And that speaks to the interest of this case. Eric, you've been following how the media has covered former President Trump since he announced back in 2015 and and you've written some some really i would call them brave columns when the media hasn't always done their job or gotten it right H have we sort of learned from covering trump over these eight years and are you seeing the coverage get getting better or is it the same as that you've seen over the last eight years it's a been a very grudging sort of process so the media is not necessarily uh, learned all the obvious lessons that were, were clear very early in this particular era. And what I'm speaking about mostly is just allowing Trump uh, live opportunities to, to lie, to spread his mendacity across the country. I think media outlets are, you know, like CNN, I think it was last year, did a town hall with him, uh, was a disaster. So media outlets need to learn that you don't let this guy spout his lies live on your air. I think that's number one. Number two is in your analysis pieces, it's very difficult to draw any sort of comparisons between Trump's uh, his activities as a candidate or as president 
with other people that have come before it, so-called normal politicians. The, 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 the analysis and the comparisons almost in there and very failed just because how much Trump lies and how how much of uh, how much of a sort of an outsider case he is. So I think those are the two main things. I think the record is maybe a, a C minus for the media on those on those fronts. Uh, I'm not terribly uh, happy with how the media has adjusted over the years. Steve, you know, we didn't have cameras in this courtroom. I know a lot of media executives, news executives probably wished this was uh, an OJ-like trial, but there were no cameras in the courtroom. <laughs> Did that help or hurt Trump, you think? I think it probably helped Trump. I mean, it's, it's hard to say because the nature of the proceedings would have been so very different had there been cameras in the courtroom. I mean, nothing would have resembled what we saw unfold or what we heard unfold or had reported to us um, as it unfolded in the past. I think, you know, when you, when you read the accounts of things like the, the reading of the guilty uh, verdicts today, just the drama there um, would have been such a gripping television moment. And if you think about Trump, you know, having had video of him in court looking sullen, uh, maybe sleeping, as reports had it, uh, that wouldn't have helped him, I think, in any way if that was what Americans were seeing. Even if they weren't paying attention to the trial, just seeing that in the, on the front page of newspapers, video all over the place, I think that would have hurt Trump. Alexander, to me, it's it's been a fascinating campaign going back to the primaries. But obviously, this is my business. I'm, I'm into this. The American people, they have, they have not shown much interest in, in this campaign or this election up until this point. There was obviously a spike with this trial. Do you think it, it dies down in the summer? Do you think it picks up with the debates? I mean, the debates are now going to be so early before the right. voting. Um, what do you think happens with this campaign? I certainly think it picks up. I think it's going to continue the, to dominate the news coverage out there. And you have to remember, this is one out of four criminal indictments. That, uh, the former president is facing. So the pressure is going to continue to be on him, not to mention that we do have that first debate between Trump and Biden coming up at the end of June. There's going to be a lot of eyeballs on that debate. And you would think that there's going to be a lot of conversation heading into that debate about what the outlook could be. So, you know, Trump just has a way of getting people to talk about him. And clearly, considering the broadcast numbers that we saw across the yeah. board, they're going to continue to lean on. Eric, we only got about 30 seconds, but I do want to ask you this last question. Is Trump winning the media game. We talked about this a lot in 2016, the unearned media, how he just sort of dominated the airwaves. Hillary Clinton could not get her message out there. Is that happening this time around? I don't see it right now. I mean, obviously, it's, it's a difficult analysis to undertake simply because it is the media's job to cover all these trials. And, you know, he does, does take the breaks and comes out and holds forth and, you know, his usual spiel, which is full of nonsense. Jack Schaefer pointed out that the Fox News takes those, uh, it, you know, basically face value all the time. The other networks didn't do it as much. But no, I don't, th I don't think it's the same. I don't think it's the same. All right. Eric, we appreciate all of your analysis. Stephen Hayes, my buddy, we appreciate that too. Alexander, it was great to meet you. We thank you all for being here on an historic night here on NBC News Now. We thank you for watching this special tonight, our special coverage of the Trump hush money trial conviction. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news still on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.